So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, today, I will take you on a short journey to the life of a prominent uh, Portuguese bourgeois family, the Coelho da Cunha, that, uh, among many other things, excelled as uh, art collectors of a typology of collectible artifacts that have been uh, largely overlooked by the discussions on art consumption in Europe, and that is azulejos or glazed ceramic tiles. Although Portugal is commonly known as the land of azulejos because the presence of this art form is so strong throughout the, the national territory, several other countries in Europe have a long tradition of collecting ceramic tiles, such as Spain, uh, Belgium, the Netherlands, um, England, and so on. However, and despite not being a national creation, in no other country but in Portugal has the use of ceramic tiles been so consistent for over 500 years now, thus being one of the, the most representative art forms of Portuguese cultural heritage. More than just decorative elements, azulejos became efficient vehicles in the transformation of space and in the way this space is perceived. However, this fundamental interrelationship with architecture has not always been respected, as the rise of the practice of collecting azulejos clearly proves. Indeed, uh, collecting azulejos implies to remove them from the walls and the space for where they were specifically made uh, in a well thought and balanced relationship with architecture and other decorative elements, thus striking them out of context and abolishing their original role. The rise of such form of art collecting that converts immovable and uh, contextualized artifacts into prized movable and uh, individual objects dates back to the 19th century and it's intimately related to the wake of the changes that uh, arose in Europe from the, the, the liberal revolution and the romantic movement. In Portugal, the flourishing of this practice was at first a, a repercussion of the extinction of the religious orders, which took place in 1834, which desacralized many convents and monasteries brimming with tiles to which would follow other historical upheavals, but also urban transformation processes and heritage restoration policies. As a result, many of these um, wall coverings and panels were either destroyed or put up for sale, as these news newspapers that you can see here uh, uh, show, thus entering in some cases private art collections. This practice has, of course, dual aspects. On the one hand, given the fact that many of these buildings were profoundly transformed, uh, demolished or abandoned, collecting these styles can be seen, obviously, as a form of heritage preservation. On the other hand, we cannot ignore that the main problem still remains because once azulejos are moved, the vital link with architecture and the context uh, completely vanishes. Among the several collections of azulejos gathered by private art collectors in Portugal in the 19th century, the one formed by the family Coelho da Cunha is one of the most interesting ones, as it is paradigmatic of the aspirations of the new elite that emerged from the boom of the newspaper industry in the 19th century. Indeed, Maria Adelaide, that you can see here, was the eldest daughter of the founder of the Diário de Notícias, the newspaper that inaugurated in Portugal the so-called industrial journalism, that is, that in sums, sees the press as a business, as an industry, thereby being profit-oriented based on sales and advertising. It is fair to say that by the time when Maria Adelaide married Alfred da Cunha, her family was already in a, in a well position in a Lisbon society. Notwithstanding, Alfred da Cunha himself would also um, reveal to be a shrewd businessman who eventually su succeeded in making a name for himself as one of the most distinguished members of the Portuguese elite. 
Alfredo's economic and social ascent is, of course, very much linked with the role played within his father-in-law newspaper, of which he would become co-owner and director after the death of the two original founders. Notwithstanding, his merits go well beyond, beyond his participation in the Arid Noticias and other business uh, endeavors, as proven, for instance, by his involvement in a number of cultural and social uh, initiatives and associations in the fields of history, archaeology, art, tourism, and of course, journalism, but also by his career as a quite accomplished uh, writer. Then, in 1906, after several years living in a house inherited by Maria Adelaide that was conveniently located nearby uh, Diario de Noticias headquarters, the family would purchase a new home that was quite more uh, suitable, let's say, to their social aspirations, the San Vicente Palace, the future stage, as we shall see, of some of the most exclusive soirees of the city, but also a unique Museum of Azulejos. The history of the San Vicente Palace is a long one with its aristocratic origins dating back all the way to the 17th century until the present day. It is obviously not my intention to deepen such history today, but it's still important to have in mind, as we shall see, that both the acquisition of the palace and the creation of the collection are intimately related, thus mirroring the cultural and social aspirations of the art collector. As you can see here, uh, the palace is in a previous, privileged location in Lisbon, in one of the hills of the, um, on the margins of the Tagus River. It was built on a piece of land belonging to the religious order that inhabited this uh, monastery that you can see. Wait. Um, here, that you can see here, uh, which is the San Vicente de Fora Monastery. The founder of the palace or the manor house, if you prefer, was Don Diogo Soares, the secretary of the Council of Portugal in Madrid, a pivotal part, part of the government of the Kingdom of Portugal during the Iberian Union, which confirms the aristocratic origins of the state. Afterwards, for many centuries, the palace was inhabited by another noble family, the Telj de Menezes, and when we arrive in the 20th century, it belonged to the Marquis of Funchal, to whom the Coelho de Cunha would buy it from in 1906, the start in what appears to be uh, one of the most interesting and certainly more glamorous time of this uh, palace. Obviously, throughout the centuries, the state was enlarged and improved, keeping up with the necessities of different times and different owners, as it was the case of the main entrance to the palace, uh, where an, an Italian-inspired loggia was built in the early 20th century, according to the plans of an Italian architect that was uh, specialized in remodeling historical buildings, and his name was Nicola Bigaglia. The purchase of the old manor house by Alfredo da Cunha in 1906 and the follow renovation works carried out by this uh, Italian architect with the purpose of embellishing the palace appears to have been the catalyst for the formation of the collection of Azulejos, since at this point there are no evidences that suggest that Alfredo da Cunha has started the collection prior to this moment. Such behavior or chain of events in the life of, a, of an art collector was not uncommon, obviously, as when facing the large areas of the houses bought with their new fortunes, many bourgeois families naturally felt the need to fill them with beautiful things, thus becoming, in some cases, collectors of pictures, sculptures, uh, decorative arts, and so on. In this case, Alfred da Cunha became a collector of azulejos, an art form that would pay, uh, play a pivotal role in transforming the until then much more, I would say, uh, restrained uh, um, 17th century uh, palace in what was then described in the press as a true museum of art. 
Indeed, although he also collected other art forms that were tastefully displayed in the opulent rooms of the palace, no other artifacts had such a strong presence as the azulejos. As you can see in this brief uh, uh, timeline, what makes this collection so special is not only the high number of azulejos, but also the variety of specimens thus spanning five centuries of production of either geometrical patterns, figurative representations, abstract, profane, and religious scenes in small or large scale. Although part of the collection was on display inside the house, the main stage was unquestionably the garden, which itself was considerably enlarged and altered over the centuries, as these uh, little details show. For instance, by the time when Alfredo da Cunha purchased the palace in 1906, the garden was organized in, this, in a single level adjacent to the main house, but later on in 1920s, it was widely enlarged and reorganized, thus winning a new monumentality. The final result was not far from the current display, that is a carefully curated garden organized in three levels with a which applied in, in, uh, virtually in every wall. And here we have another picture where the, the profusion of azulejos uh, and its strong decorative uh, character is quite obvious. While this uh, very small uh, uh, selection of pictures shows the diversity of specimens that one can find across the garden, having on the left top corner a large scale religious uh, Baroque composition next to a combination or a mix of two 17th center, century uh, geometrical patterns, while here we have a small wall with uh, profane uh, scenes next to a large depiction of uh, Saint Christopher. But as I have said before, the collection was not uh, limited and restrained to the gardens and inside we can also find a large number of azulejos in most of the rooms from the staircase located after the main entrance to uh, several uh, li uh, li social uh, rooms, such as the ballroom and the library, but also the dining room or the play or pool room. Well, as uh, all of you know, in the fields of art market and history of collecting, determining the provenance of an artifact is of uh, utmost importance, being that in the case of azulejos, the stakes are even higher, given that, as I have explained, azulejos are an integral part of the space for where they were specifically made. Therefore, when researching the provenance of a set of azulejos, what we intend to do is not only to establish the history of ownership from the moment upon uh, when they were uh, removed from the walls and into the private collection, but also to rewind a bit more, this trying to reconstruct the original context and thereby contributing to preserving uh, such memory. The study of the provenance of these azulejos uh, are, uh, is still a work in progress, progress. Nonetheless, the data gathered so far already suggests that in terms of typology of the buildings from where these azulejos were, were removed, these were both religious and civil uh, buildings. Then, if we zoom in on the place of origin of such azulejos, we understand that most of them uh, came from buildings located in the center of Portugal, with the highest percentage corresponding to either convents, monasteries, uh, churches, uh, or aristocratic states located in the region of Lisbon, where the São Vicente Palace is also located, as you can see uh, here in, the, uh, in this, uh, in this uh, image. The underlying reason is simply is simple. Uh, whether these azulejos were acquired by the collector uh, in auctions, in uh, an antique shops, or from art dealers, the preferential market was the one closest to home. So this is, was this was just a, a matter of uh, convenience and opportunity, really. 
And it is, of course, important to remember that at the time when the, the, the collection was being formed, there was no such thing as a shortage of uh, opportunity. For instance, the azulejos that you can see in this fireplace came from the convent of Sant Antonio in Villa Franca de Xira to the right, which was closed down in 1834 upon the suppression of the religious orders. Then the convent was abandoned before being uh, purchased and adapted to, uh, um, to different functions, from a factory to a mausoleum, for instance. And in this period, several sets of azulejos were put up for sale and ended up being acquired by different buyers. As a, another example, and a, a not a azulejo related one, we also have this altar here that until the mid uh, 1920s was placed in the facade of this building in, uh, in Lisbon, um, from where it was eventually uh, removed and acquired to embellish the garden of São Vicente Palace. Another interesting aspect of this collection lies in its form of display and fruition, which was not by any means limited to the family, but rather extended to an extensive uh, social network. Indeed, following the acquisition and remodeling of the historical palace, the until then quiet, discreet uh, family began hosting some of the most impressive parties held in Lisbon in this period, thus strengthening their position in the capital social elite. When the war broke out in Europe, the famous parties held at São Vicente slowed down and eventually obviously stopped, but until then they did gather the city's elite, as you can see here in this uh, social network graph, thus playing a role that from a sociological point of view uh, cannot be undervalued in the sense that they attested a radical uh, change or transformation as the most important social uh, events were now no longer hosted by uh, noble families, but rather by the bourgeoisie uh, in outstanding houses and palaces that once belonged to these uh, aristocratic uh, noble families, such as was the case of the São Vicente uh, Palace. Notwithstanding, the most important, important thing to, to highlight now, it is the close relationship between Alfredo da Cunha, the art collector, and some key individuals that may help us in the future to better understand not only the collection, but also the collector. In this spirit, one must take a closer look to the friendship with the architect uh, Raulino, who moreover was not a simple guest in these parties, but the pivotal part of it, as he uh, wrote and staged several uh, plays. Moreover, Linu was an eminent architect known for using both new and antique tiles in his project, thus acknowledging azulejos as a fundamental element of Portuguese art, an idea that he clearly shared with his friend Alfredo da Cunha. On another note, the attendance of the painter Columban Bordal Pinheiro is paradigmatic of the support provided by the art collector to living artists, whose work he also collected and promoted through exhibitions. At the same time, such presence also attests to the effort put by the hosts, as we have determined that at least in one occasion, Columbano was responsible for the decoration of the rooms where the parties took place. Such task was shared with Manuel Emilio da Silva, one of the closest friends of Alfredo da Cunha and himself an impressive art collector of ceramics. These were just a few uh, of the guests that often filled the São Vicente Palace uh, to take part or simply to watch the shows put together and played by talented amateurs. These were mostly artistic and literary events with poetry reading and theater plays that quite often put into display uh, the owner's taste for art. 
For instance, one of the shows presented was this living picture or, or, or tableau vivant depicting a visit of two cardinals and a group of ladies to the, to the atelier of the Spanish painter Murillo. While here, we can see another living uh, picture called the antique dealer. The most interesting uh, aspect beside the topic uh, being the paintings on the back, like the large Watteau uh, picture uh, next to the antique dealer, who are not real paintings, but indeed living actors presented like paintings. And that's precisely what we also have here with a, a, a living depiction of an azulejo panel entitled The Muse. Then in 1914, the war broke out in Europe, obviously the social life slowed down, but the decisive event would only, only take place in 1918 when Maria Adelaide ran away with a lover, the family's driver. As a result, she was admitted to a mental institution and diagnosed with madness by the most uh, prominent doctors of the time, no doubt thanks to the social influence of her husband. Then she lost all her assets and was considered uh, interdicted, that is a person who is, not, uh, who is incapable of uh, making decisions about her person and her property. Maria Adelaide fought uh, uh, back as, as she could, uh, being a woman in this time, having published uh, her own version of the events and proving she was definitely not mad, just a woman who was in love after being mistreated by so many years by her husband, Alfred da Cunha. Alfredo, of course, retaliated and the story made headlines in the Portuguese press for several years. Notwithstanding, uh, despite this uh, horrible uh, stain in the history of the family and the history of the palace, the collection of azulejos persisted and was even enlarged in the following uh, decades by the son José Eduardo. Over the years, the palace changed hands on several occasions, currently being a private residence, but despite all the vicissitudes, the collection still lives on, even if behind closed doors. Thank you. Honoré Daumier's connoisseur, a wealthy collector, in, in Daumier's connoisseur, a wealthy collector sits surrounded by objects that in his view represent taste and success. He admires a small replica of the Venus de Milo. And behind him is an ancient bust or a copy of one whose head is tilted downwards so that its gaze also falls upon the sensual nude. Notably in this refined environment, the collector is also surrounded by drawings. Oh, excuse me. Can you hear me all right? Okay. Notably in this refined environment, the collector is also surrounded by drawings, which can be seen on the wall directly behind Venus and on the ground beside him in a portfolio he has only just finished perusing. His hands are crossed contentedly as he sinks comfortably in his chair. In his mind, he is the epitome of cultured elegance and refined intellectualism. This paper will consider how some collectors utilize drawings to enhance their reputations as arbiters of taste. A keen interest in collecting drawings became apparent when, in 1879, theretofore unseen to public eyes, almost 700 drawings owned by dozens of collectors were exhibited at the Ecole des Beaux-Arts. Twenty-eight of the drawings in this exhibition were borrowed from um, Charles Philippe Genevieve, also known as the Marquis. He described drawings as the first dream, the first germ, the first conception. He viewed himself not just as an impassioned collector, but also as responsible for recording and sharing the history of art. He started working in art museums in his mid twenties and within a decade was responsible for organizing the Salon. Held in Paris, this exhibition was regarded as the most important and influential in Europe. 
Before his 50th birthday, he was appointed assistant curator of the Louvre. Six years later, he was appointed director of fine arts in which he inventoried and assessed works of art held in public and private collections throughout France. He was also responsible for public art projects such as the decoration of the Pantheon. His passion, though centered around the monuments, centered around the moments of inventive spark that he believed drawings captured. Chenevier reviewed the 1879 exhibition at the École de Beaux-Arts in a series of five articles in the Gazette de Beaux-Arts, all but the first written after the closing of the exhibition. The first article was designed to inspire artistic superiority over the British, not only in terms of French artists, but also the collections produced in France. In their disdain of the British, the, cur the curators, uh, Charles Euphrussi and Gustave Dreyfus, only exhibited three drawings from the English school out of a total of 674 works. 229 were Italian, nine were Spanish, 39 were German, 91 were Dutch, 45 were from Flanders, and 254 were French. Notably in the same issue as the first article is another, is another article on Michelangelo drawing studies owned by Chenevier. The second in the five article series considered German art as compared to French calling German artworks tangled, complicated, rough and awkward. While French drawings he described as elegant and clear. The third article in his series assessed the curator selections which he acknowledges were made as much due to the collectors as the artists of the drawings and argued that a more holistic view of art should be built from the example of this exhibition. It is this desire to create a complete history of artistic talent that drove Chenevier's selections for his own collection and also to write um, a series of essays about his collection, which he hoped to compile, compile into a, um, a book showing the history of French art. In the fourth article, the Marquis discussed Watteau, Boucher, and other Rococo masters, and praises Edmond de Goncourt's understanding of these 18th century artists, which is appropriate considering 109 works owned by Monsieur Goncourt were in the 1879 exhibition. Monsieur Goncourt's knowledge of the Rococo period was also highlighted in the introductory essay to the catalog. It was not until the final article that Chenevier offered a more complete breakdown of all the works in the exhibition and hails it as triumphant, one that surely pleases amateurs and the public. Following this, in, immediately um, next in the journal, is a 10-page essay by Charles Euphrussi, one of the curators of the exhibition, praising Chenevier for his knowledge of the arts and highlighting his works lent to the 1879 exhibition. It is clear that the Marquis and Edmond de Goncourt choreographed this exhibition and the reviews to build their reputations as connoisseurs. In 1884, another exhibition of drawings also held at the Col de Beaux-Arts was used to raise funds for struggling artists and their families. This exhibition combined past masters with living artists and in addition to a few collectors, drawings were donated by artists as well as dealers, including Albert Goupil and Georges Petit. Goncourt contributed seven drawings out of the 1,003 that were exhibited. Chenevier did not lend any. During February of that year, the same month the exhibition opened, the Marquis wrote an article in the Gazette de Beaux-Arts reviewing an 18th century exhibition at Georges Petit's gallery. He concluded by critiquing the display of Mon Monsieur Goncourt's sketches that were, quote, haphazardly hung in the long entrance hall with insufficient light, end quote, before referring back to the 1879 exhibition where Goncourt's drawings were, quote, consecrated. No mention was made of the concurrent drawing exhibition, which was almost twice as large and held in the same location. Chenevier 
collected drawings created between 1500 and 1860, so was likely not interested in the contemporary artists shown in the 1884 exhibition and probably disagreed with their display um, near masters of the past. Chenevier claimed to have nearly 4,000 drawings in his collection. Over 500 of these were identified for a 2007 exhibition at the Louvre in 2007. Oh, in 2007. It seems particularly fitting to highlight that one of these drawings, shown on the right, the purification of the Virgin by 17th century French artist Jean Ristot is now owned by one of the curators of this 2007 exhibition. The Goncourt brothers, Edmund and Jules, were not known only for their writings and eccentricities, but also their collecting and interest in both Japanese and, as already discussed, 18th century French art. The Goncourt brothers were significant in the evolution of an appreciation for drawing in the 19th century, as their French drawings were shown to the public three times. Two, already discussed, were for the exhibitions held at the Col de Beaux-Arts. Goncourt contributed eight, 108 drawings in 1879 and 12, seven drawings by Pierre Gavarni in 1884. The third time occurred upon the death of Jules, or of, of Edmund, I'm sorry, who requested in his will that their collection be auctioned off. My wish is that my drawings, my prints, my curiosities, my books, in a word, these things that of art, art, which would have been the joy of my life, shall not be consigned to the cold tomb of the museum and subjected to the stupid glance of the careless passerby. But I require that they shall be dispersed under the hammer of the auctioneer so that the pleasure which the acquiring of each one of them has given me shall be given again in each case to some inheritor of my tastes. One auction was devoted solely to the Goncourt's 18th century French drawings. 377 artworks filled three rooms at the Hotel du Roi. Within the catalog for the auction, the Goncourt's appreciation of drawings was discussed as integral to their ability to understand the nature of artists. In this way, the collectors were linked to the earliest artist biographies, such as Giorgio Vasari, Val Danucci, and Pierre-Jean Mariette. The variety of media that was displayed is extraordinary. Ink, pencil, watercolor, gouache, sanguine, charcoal, pastel, and of course, the 19th century favorite, eau trois croyants, which is um, the use of red, white, and black. This starky, striking charcoal portrait we've been looking at um, drawing by Felice Bracamont was described by one critic as beautiful and destined to be engraved and was exhibited in the 1880 Impressionist exhibition. It was indeed engraved and as can be seen on the right, um, we have Monsieur Goncourt admiring himself as he does any of the great works of the art of art in the portfolio beside him. Fortuitously, uh, photographs do survive of Edmond in his home surrounded by his prized collection. He is lounging, not unlike Sardanopolis in Delacroix's famous painting. Behind him, drawings and prints cover the wall. We can see the kind of French gold framing used for drawings. The so-called passaporto is used in which an opening is cut in the mat for the paper, which is then bordered with thin gold. This photograph taken in 1890 shows Edmund posing before his drawing collection, which is protected in large portfolios behind and beside him. Besides the three frame drawings that surround him, a painted portrait of him, which is at first glance uh, looks like a mirror, hangs high above the portfolio of drawings up here. And these are the portfolios.
private salons were exclusive, uh, were, were spaces where literature, music, and all the arts were discussed and performed. The salon most discussed in the Goncourt's journal was that of Princess Matilda Bonaparte, cousin of Napoleon III, who came to be called the Notre Dame de Art for her um, influence on contemporary artists. And on August 16, 1862, the brothers wrote in their journal about the first time they met her. The princess comes down, we are introduced. She is a rather large woman, the remains of a beautiful woman, a rather mottled skin, a withdrawn face, rather small eyes whose expression one does not see very well, the manner of an aging courtesan, and a surface cordiality which does not entirely hide an underlying reserve. Um, then after the guests arrive, the princess, quote, takes her place in her second salon beside a basket full of little pugs, which she adores and which follow her everywhere. And the Goncourts will, will really um, talk about these pugs and, and how much they dislike them throughout their journals. In August 1865, the Goncourts remark how she bestows upon her guest a diamond cross, which is, quote, her custom to give to those decorated through her influence. And after eating, they look over Eugene Girard's drawings while she poses for her bust by Carpeau, um, which is shown here on the left. As can be seen in the painting on the right, um, which shows part of her home, she was an avid collector, um, including drawings. On the right is a group of black and white, I'm talking about right here, a group of black and white drawings covering what appears to be a piece of furniture. This may be what was described by the Goncourt brothers as a shrine covered by Ernest Hebert's drawings. Princess Matilda, as an artist herself, had a particular appreciation for the visual arts. Under the tutelage of Hebert and Eugene Girard, the princess was said to paint at least two hours a day she exhibited six drawings at the official salon and in 1863 was awarded a medal for her watercolors that year. However, she made a point to purchase another medal to replace the one she was given, thereby allowing another artist to be awarded that year. The posthumous sale of her collection took place in 1904 at George Petit's gallery and included 16 drawings from old masters, including Maurice Quentin de Latour, Robert Mutel, and Tiepolo. Note in the image on the right, in which she is shown art making in her studio, drawings and watercolors cover the walls. One final collector, Emile Gavet, should be mentioned for his manipulation of the art market through the collection and sale of drawings. By 1866, Millet was well known for his paintings, but Monsieur Gavet was more interested in collecting drawings from the artist. As has been well researched by Alan Chong, Gavet proposed to offer Millet 1,000 francs per month plus supplies in exchange for a series of pastels. He did not determine the subject matter, but asked Millet to give him exclusivity as a collector of his pastels. Upon the death of Millet in 1875, Gavet choreographed an exhibition of 46 pastels by the artist at Georges Petit's gallery. One month later, after wetting the appetite for Millet's works, he sold all of his 95 Millet pastels at the Drouot auction house, earning 370,000 francs in profit. Two of these pastels are shown here. Drawings provided a unique opportunity for collectors because of their lower cost and the rise of the bourgeoisie. However, the, by the end of the 19th century, interest in drawings had more to do with the desire to try and capture the inspiration that fueled artists. Drawings did, as they do today, bring us closer to an artist's decision-making choices and creative process. Thank you. First, I wanted to, uh, I wanted to ask Vera about, um, uh, about the, the encyclopedic approach that uh, somehow uh, the Cunha family has in, uh, in building, they they are they, they collection of uh, 
um, uh, of uh, azulejos. Uh, if they ex they are explaining their approach, or it is just an accident because they they've been uh, so passionate by this medium uh, as that uh, they 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 were collecting everything that they found on the uh, on the art market. This is my first question. Uh, the second one is um, uh, when I was uh, looking at this amazing uh, photographs of Im living images, uh, uh, I was actually uh, thinking about the, the first part of the session and uh, uh, Manga Yashinsky uh, collection and uh, their uh, connection, his connection with uh, network of artists and intellectuals and uh, a national movement. And in that context, I was thinking if um, this, uh, this craft, which was so long lasting for Portuguese uh, in this very, uh, the end of 19th century, beginning of the 20th century, is that collection wasn't a little bit, uh, um, a proposed that doesn't have a purpose to find the golden age of uh, uh, Portuguese empire. I don't know if it, it, if it was something more than uh, just uh, searching uh, to save the patrimony, uh, which was connected with secularization and uh, the, the aesthetic uh, or deco decorative uh, issues. That's my, my two questions. <laughs> Thank you, Agnieszka. Um, regarding your first uh, question, uh, uh, the collection has uh, clearly uh, an encyclopedic uh, nature, but uh, unfortunately, we don't have um, many sources to that allow like the direct sources that allow us to uh, um, understood understand what were the motivations of, of this uh, of this family and especially of of uh, of Alfredo da Cunha. Uh, so I, I I cannot guarantee that uh, they they they. Um, that they had an intention of build a complete collection, encyclopedic collection, or if they only the collection gained these these characteristics and dimension and all that because it was what was available at that time. So I'm I'm not I'm not sure if it was a, a, a will of just a consequence of the of the of the context and the, what was then uh, uh, in in the in the market but uh, and in connection with your second question what uh, uh, so far what i have understand and i i, I stand by it is that um, uh, he uh, clearly uh, understood uh, as uh, mm -hmm. uh, as um, a, a, a one of the most, if not the most, representative art form of uh, Portuguese cultural heritage. So, uh, in, in a way, uh, instead of uh, collecting uh, pictures or sculptures like everyone was doing, or furniture like French furniture, empire, whatever, uh, he he opted to 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 choose this this uh, this medium, this uh, type of art form because of its um, uh, uh, historical and uh, identitary uh, meaning. And that's very, very, very clear because you understand that also from his writings as an author that he was really into the Portuguese identity and Portuguese culture. So uh, clearly there was this um, this sense of uh, collecting and uh, uh, preserving, but uh, I believe most uh, mostly uh, collect uh, without uh, this. Um, 
uh, this uh, this end of being also preserving it. Now we see uh, this way, and that the art collectors from the same period clearly collected with uh, with the intention of also protecting. In this case, I'm not uh, sure, but uh, I'm pretty sure about the his understanding and his approach to as a, a, a symbol of uh, Portuguese cultural and identity that he used to 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 build uh, or to strengthening his uh, his social position in the Portuguese uh, elite. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. There is another question from uh, on the chat. Uh, are azulejos az azulejos uh, present in former Portuguese colonies too? If yes, uh, were the uh, they objects of a similar uh, collecting approach as in Portugal? Yeah, uh, obviously. Uh, um, you can find azulejos in all uh, former Portuguese colonies, especially in uh, in churches and monasteries. Uh, if you if you look, for instance, for Brazil, they have this uh, huge uh, and wonderful world of of, of azulejos as well, and they do have also a tradition of uh, collecting of collecting uh, azulejos. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, thank you so much, uh, Vera. Uh, now we will skip to the question uh, for Deborah. Um, uh, I will be be begin by the by chat. Thank you so much for wonderful reports. My question is to Deborah: If uh, is there any research on the Gong uh, 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 type of collecting? Maybe some literature you can recommend. It was. Uh, noted yesterday that it was way a lot collecting affected uh, a lot of Europeans collectors at the turn of 20th century. So, uh, could you give us some some indications and uh, references? Yes, they're very. Um, their style was considered very eclectic, very heavy on um, 18th century, including the kind of erotic undertones. Um, mm -hmm. And of course, then they had an interest of um, Japanese um, decorative arts as well. Um, Wiesmann's Aurobor is supposed to be somewhat influenced by their kind of quirkiness. Mm -hmm. um, and in fact, the Goncor wrote a book called La Maison de l'Artiste. Mm -hmm. And um, he wanted to actually it was a description of their of their home, and and um, Edmund wanted to be able to have um, images of his home within the book, but that never happened. So it has some really good descriptions of of the different rooms, Maison de Lattes. But if there is uh, any uh, contemporary research uh, which is going on the the collection, I think that uh, this is the meaning of the question <laughs> from the chat. Well, I mean, it's difficult because we what we have to work off of are, the, are these pictures that I've shown you. Mm -hmm. And then um, because his uh, his his collection was dispersed, you're talking about um, Pete, how he how he influenced others. Uh, yes, uh, no, it was. Um, uh, if there is ongoing uh, research on concord type of collecting in general, I think so. Yeah. Yes. Um, not, you know, not really just trying to trying to gather what was in the home based off, off of studying La Maison d'un Artiste. Mm -hmm. um, and it wasn't actually, um, their type of collecting was actually pretty unique. It might, it was influential in type of its, in terms of its sort of grandeur, but um, it wasn't really mimicked for the types of works that they collected a lot. Most people were not as interested in the 18th century as they were. Our collectors were usually interested in before or after the 18th century, so they were sort of unique in that way. Mm -hmm. Okay, and um, another question is, uh, at what time has started the white uh, market of drawings, especially auctions? Um, well, the auction house, um, Hotel Drouot, really kind of became, you know, monopolized the auction industry in the mid 
19th century. And there were um, auctions before that, and there were, were dealers before that, but that really started taking off, especially by like the 1860s. Um, and the, there was kind of this explosion of um, interest in works on paper, drawings and prints, really beginning 1870s, 1880s, they just become much more prominent. There's these um, this growth in artist society. So in the 1870s, the watercolor society begins. In the 1880s, the pastel society begins. And when, when, when the artists start to create these societies that are only about works on paper, they also have um, exhibitions and they have these exhibitions at dealer houses. So it's all about kind of, um, you know, the commodity system and, and then becoming um, more saleable artworks. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, do you think that um, uh, the, the, the editions of uh, drawings, sketchbooks, uh, which, uh, which flourished in, in the, uh, in the uh, 80s, 70s, 80s, have an impact on uh, passion for drawing? I mean, the printed version of uh, the great old masters like uh, Raphael, Michelangelo, and so on. Uh, do you think that that this uh, cheap editions, printed editions, cheap? I don't. I mean, <laughs> it was, however, a, a treasure for for uh, for, um, uh, for for uh, for that time, but. Uh, uh, the, the, the impact of industry of uh, printing old master drawings. Yes, uh, definitely. And in fact, there become a lot of training manuals become really common, um, not necessarily for just artists, but for the, the public. Mm -hmm. um, there are a lot, there's a lot more, especially in, it begins really in England where there's these, um, a lot of amateurs that want to go create watercolors out in nature and take these these training manuals with them mm. to learn how to create you know and they can watercolors are easy to um, transport mm -hmm. and paper is mm -hmm. is easier to get so that kind of begins this more public interest as well as the desire in, for the public to try and create artworks themselves and then therefore a greater appreciation in in that process when seeing um, more master drawings. Mm -hmm.